So today I wanted to talk about social anxiety. I'm going to come at this from two angles. The first is through perspective, and the second is through responsibility and projection. So an analogy from my first angle. Imagine that you're driving down the road, and at some point you get to just an empty field, and you, you, you want to clear your head. You're tired of all the anxiety and the, and the stress you have from your job and from your family or from whatever business you have. You just want to walk around and clear your head. So you leave and you walk about one or two miles down in an empty field, and at some point you see a fence. You walk up to the fence, and as you get closer to the fence, you see that there's barbed wire at the top of the fence. When you see the barbed wire, you're really close to it, and you see that there's a bunch of people inside with orange jumpsuits on, surrounded by armed guards. They're talking to one another, they're lifting weights, they're laughing, they're joking, and when you get up to the fence, one of the people says, are you lost? And you go, no, I'm just walking around enjoying myself, and then the guy inside goes, man, it looks to me like you're in prison. Now to you, this may seem weird. They're clearly inside of an enclosed area they cannot leave, they're surrounded by armed guards, and you're just walking around enjoying your day. You are free, but you have to think about it. You have to think about perspective. From their perspective, they're having the normal conversations they usually have. They're doing the things that they're used to doing, and they're looking through a fence. And they look up and they see barbed wire. So if they're enjoying themselves and you're just walking around, kind of not really sure where you're going, it's very, it's, it's very reasonable for them to imagine that you are the one in prison. Here, it's an issue of perspective. As long as there's no ceiling, as long as, no, as long as we're outside, it very well could be that you are the one in prison. Now, the thing with perspective and how this relates to social anxiety is that I find that many of the people who are going to accuse you of having social anxiety, who are going to say that you're socially awkward, you're socially weird, why are you so anxious, why are you nervous, are going to be people who they themselves are nervous, who they themselves are inside the prison of caring what other people think of them. And this is one of the things with, that I talk about when it comes to projection, that other people often project onto you their own issues. This happens everywhere in modern society. An example recently was with this company where the CTO fired a junior developer. This was on, on the front page of Reddit about a month ago because he wound up deleting or destroying their production database. Now, the, the, the junior developer may have may have made some mistakes here but the real burden of liability the the serious issue lies with the fact that production credentials were included in some type of training manual or beginner's manual and that a junior developer on their first day even has the permissions or credentials or ability to delete your entire database, which is not properly backed up. Rather than the CTO take responsibility or accountability for their failings, they projected their failings onto the new employee, fired them, said that they had, ru you know, they had ruined everything and made it appear as if everything was their fault. It's commonplace in modern society for people in places of authority to blame others for their problems and their failings and their shortcomings. This is particularly evident in the public school system. You'll have a teacher that fails at getting across a concept to a student. They fail at creating a lesson plan that is engaging. They fail at understanding how a young mind absorbs and learns new information. So they will take somebody who may get a 140 on an IQ test, who may be able to you know, figure out how Arduino circuits work and put things together on their own time or follow the plot and all the puzzles in a complex, intricate video game. They'll take that child and they'll say, you must have ADD. It's not my teaching. It's not my problem. It's not my lesson plan. It's you. It, so they'll talk to the parents and they'll get the parents to, to, break the, to take the kid to a doctor or a psychiatrist and get them medication for their ADD, something that screws with the chemical uh, chemicals inside your brain and screws with your brain chemistry, screws with how you think, screws with how you feel. All of this just to avoid personal accountability or responsibility. It's very common for people to have the perspective that it's somebody else's problem and it's very often uh, other people's prerogative to project their problem onto others. And this is what I believe happens very often with social anxiety. I find that a lot of people in the modern world are not very good at connecting. I find that, and you see this with every, with all these just really short conversations. You know, I have these conversations with new people, and a lot of these conversations seem to hit the wall at around two to four minutes in. I'm not sure if you notice this, but you can talk about the weather. You can talk about something silly somebody did across the street. You can talk about last night's sports game. But after you're done talking about, oh, look at that person that almost tripped because of the silly dress they're wearing, or, uh, oh, did you see the game last night? Or, yeah, this rain really sucks. The conversation seems to go to hell after that. 
And the reason it goes to hell after that is because most people lack depth. Most people are incapable of having an identity because most people are stuck within the prison of caring what other people think of them. Especially when you're a kid, you'll notice that people hyper-focus on this when they're children because you have to worry about bullying, you have to worry about this, this terrible environment of 30 people in a room that you can't get out of that, uh, that will be, are allowed to do it and say whatever they want about you while the teacher is not looking. And, and particularly because when you're a child, you don't really have the opportunity to change your environment. So you, don't, you have no choice. You are stuck in this environment with people that have this very narrow worldview. And you may not know what to think. You don't know what to say. Do I care too little or do I care too much? Do I get really angry or do I act really happy? Do I say that I like this type of music or do I say that I hate this type of music because if I say I like this type of music, I'll get picked on. So you have a lot of people that don't have, that grow up not having an identity. They don't know what they should like or shouldn't like, so they look to everybody else to follow what they're doing. So if they see somebody that's not getting picked on or they see somebody that seems popular, They'll just emulate that other person's identity. The problem with this is that the people who grow up like this never really gain the ability to form their own ideas, their own thoughts, their own opinions, because they are so used to being afraid of the, um, of the retaliation from other people when they say or feel the wrong way. So if you are having a conversation and you hit that wall and then you decide to discuss a serious topic, and even if you're not being judgmental in any way, if you're simply just asking some, you share the honesty of your human experience, and then you suggest that they do the same, a lot of people will react very poorly to this. Perhaps they walk away. Maybe they make a funny look at you. Maybe they get a little, maybe they give you a little, mm -hmm, or, they, or they say something mean, or they laugh at you, or they, or they make fun of you because you dared to share the honesty of your human experience. You tried to connect. You tried to connect with a person on a higher level than a superficial conversation. You try to learn something about their identity. The problem is that they don't have an identity. Because the other person does not have an identity, and you do, they are going to feel threatened, and they are going to shut down. They're not going to understand why they're shutting down. You're going to notice that. And because you're still in the prison of caring what other people think of you, then you're going to go, oh, well, I shouldn't do that because every time I share the honesty of my human experience, people get irritated and I care about what people think of me, so I'm not going to share who I am because if I share what I'm experiencing, then other people are going to get mad and I don't want people to get mad now, do I? And the reality is that you have to stop caring what other people think of you. You should only care what you think of you. Can you live with yourself? Can you live with the decisions you make? Can you live with the statements that you've said? Can you live with, the, with the, your stances on, on, uh, on world issues? And if you can, that's all that matters. I'm not suggesting that you give yourself a license to be a complete asshole and be, act foolish all the time just because I don't care what other people think. You still, have to, you still have to look in the mirror at the end of the day and be able to live with who you are. What I'm suggesting is that you, you stop the projection. You stop allowing other people to take their problems and make them your problems. Stop allowing other people to park their baggage and their shit in your driveway. This is what you're doing when you decide that you are no longer going to share the honesty of your human experience with others because they act funny. The people who start acting funny, the people who laugh, the people who make fun, the people who go and walk away because you have shared the honesty of your human experience without being crude, the people who do that are doing that as a defense mechanism because they don't have an identity and they are threatened by the fact that you have an identity and they don't even understand why it is they're doing it. They haven't gone to enough therapy. They don't have enough self-knowledge. They haven't studied enough to figure out that they have been trained from childhood to look to others and what other people think in order to create their own identity rather than be themselves. So what do you do when you say something, when you break the wall in that conversation? What do, you do? what do you do when you do that to people who don't have an identity? You threaten them. And when somebody is threatened, they act out. They lash out by making the funny face, by laughing, by making fun of you. Now, since you are still in the prison of caring what other people think of you, what are you going to do? You're going to say, okay, I'm, you, you're going to make a logical association if you're intelligent that when I share the honesty of my human experience, other people get angry. I care what people think. I don't want people to get angry. I don't want people to feel offended. I don't want people to shut down. I don't want people to be sad or weird or feel awkward around me. So you're naturally, logically going to stop sharing the honesty of your human experience. Now, how does this manifest itself to the world? 
the world is going to look at you and say, huh, this person doesn't talk when around other people. This person doesn't share their opinions. This person looks down when they enter a room. This person doesn't want to go to events where they meet and talk with other people. The reason that that's going to occur is because you did not want to offend others others. So because other people have parked their baggage, their bad childhoods, their shit, their lack of an identity in your driveway, you are shutting down and you are not interfacing with the world. And for some reason, other people have the balls to say that you are the one with the problem when they're the ones with the problem. See, it goes back to the prison analogy. You think that you're in a prison when in reality, it's everybody else that's in the prison. It's not you. They're the ones surrounded by armed guards. They're the ones that if they want to escape, have to climb over a barbed wire fence. They can't see the fact that you're the one that's free because you parked your car a mile down the road. But if you simply walk a mile down the road to your car, you can drive wherever you want. Whereas if they try to exit the prison, they get shot and you don't. Stop allowing other people to convince you that you're in a prison when they're the one stuck behind a barbed wire fence. Why did you cease expressing your identity to the world to appease people that don't even have one? As we've discussed, this is about their lack of depth, their lack of identity, their lack of self-knowledge, and their lack of honesty. So if this is a problem of other people, then why are you the one on Paxil? Why are you the one on Paraxetine? Why are you the one on Zoloft? Because there is no amount of medicine that you can take that will fix other people's problems. No amount of pills, whether it's a pill, an injection, or something you just pour into a spoon, you drink. There's no amount of medication that you can take that will fix other people's problems. And if you think that that's going to fix things, it's not. It's a temporary solution provided by people that take $175 an hour of your money and go, how do you feel about that? And how do you feel about that? And how does that make you feel? And what'd you feel when, you th when they said that? And what did you think of that? And if you're going to a therapist, Find a real therapist. Find a real psychologist. Find somebody who's going to engage with you and actually point out the things that you could change or do better rather than simply mirror back to you everything that you already say, think, and feel. Find someone with the balls to suggest that maybe, just maybe, this is somebody else's problem before you accept a prescription for a bunch of mind-altering crap. That first step is a very hard step to take. That step where you stop caring about other people's problems. And it's, it's, it's something that you're gonna have to begin with very slowly, and you're gonna have to give yourself a couple of rights. And the first right that I want you to give yourself is in one single instance, in some isolated instance, whether you drive 50 miles away from your hometown just so that you can have this and just so that you can give yourself that, that freedom, that ability in this one case to not care what other people think. I want you to give yourself the freedom of not caring what someone else thinks of you. And this is something that's gonna you're gonna have to start with baby steps. With me, I started it in my preteen years, around preteen to teenage years. I would walk up to people and say, having fun? I know, sounds silly, lame, whatever. I'd be at work, I'd be doing whatever I'm doing, and I'd be busting my ass. I would see somebody else that's busting their ass, and I would look over them at, uh, at them at some point and go, having fun? And that would give them an opportunity to share whether they liked what they were doing or hated what they were doing, whether they liked their boss or hated their boss, whether they liked their coworkers or hated their coworkers. It would encourage some sort of dialogue. And it's a statement that just, it's really difficult for them to be able to judge me on. It's also difficult for me to be, for it to be perceived as a statement where I am judging them. I haven't talked about my opinions. I haven't talked about politics. I haven't talked about what music I like. I haven't talked about what, um, you know, what I want to do with my life. All I've done is said, having fun. It gives them a, a number of different ways to respond to what it is I've said. And the first time I said that and I realized that the world didn't end, it's like, huh, wait, this ain't that bad. And then when I did it a, a number of times and I realized that there was no negative response, I realized that, that what was called social anxiety was actually my fear of other people's pre-programmed responses to what I was saying. And as time went on, I realized that I wasn't anxious when talking to people. And then I started uh, to get to a point where I would just sharpen the skill every single day. And this is something that I, that I think you can do. If you, are tr if you truly, honestly believe you have social anxiety, give yourself the freedom to drive 40 miles out of the way, walk into a gas station, buy something, and have some dumbass conversation with the cashier or the clerk. Just say something. And if you, if you cannot come up with a single thing to say, start reading up on economics, news, politics, uh, money, uh, you know, psychology, world issues, whatever it is, read up on stuff so that you actually understand what's going on in the world and read up on something, get to a point where you, you hit something that you have an opinion on, that you feel something about. 
and then ask somebody else what they think of it. Or yeah, you could just make a silly example. Like a year ago, I remember reading this article where they shot down, this guy was playing with a drone. He wasn't doing anything nefarious with it. And somebody just shot it down just because it just so happened to go over their backyard. It wasn't even sitting, you know, we know it wasn't even like straying there. We just go, some, you know, some teenager flying around his drone. And I remember asking somebody about this. Maybe you find something like that. Find something and ask the cashier about it and see what they say. Once you engage with somebody and you realize that a trap door doesn't open under you, you'll be okay to do it again and again and again. And the more you do that, the more you will realize that it's not scary. And the more you do that, the more the better you will get at not caring what other people think. You just have to go with that first instance. Care what you think of yourself. Don't care what they think of you. Give yourself the freedom of not caring if they respond badly. This is the whole point of drive away from work, drive away from home, know that you're never going to see this person again, and just engage. Connect. That is the point of the human experience, to connect, to talk to people, to share your identity in the hopes that somebody else will share theirs. I said that I like to sharpen this skill on a regular basis, and I make sure to make at least one attempt every single day to do so. And because I care about following my own advice, because I care about living by this concept of, of caring what I think of myself but not caring what others think of me or whether or not they react badly, every now and then I'll push the envelope. Every now and then, maybe like a few times a week, I'll push the envelope or I know I'm probably going to make somebody feel a little bit uncomfortable. I'm not going to be mean. I'm not going to be an asshole. I'm not going to go above and beyond to, you know, to put them on the spot. But I will, I, maybe I'll bring something up that's a little controversial, or maybe I'll, I'll just, you know, kind of figure out where the boundaries are as to what, you know, what they feel comfortable with. Uh, but I do it every now and then. I mean, this is like a recent example. Just, uh, actually, this is a fun one. Recently, I walked into a restaurant that I like to eat at. I eat there on a regular basis. And I walk in and they've got this new employee, some 18 or 19 year old woman that is pretty much going out of her way to look like she doesn't wear clothes. I mean, I walk in and it's like, huh. Either you're naked or your pants are the exact same color as your skin. And, uh, and oh, oh God, they are. It's like every single day you walk in, there's this like recurring joke between uh, her and somebody else there. It's like she, one time she, um, there's this one time that I walk in and she goes, you notice anything different about me today? And I go, you're wearing clothes. Oh, yeah, and your hair seems slightly darker than usual. But wow, you're wearing clothes. And, and, and so it's been like a back and forth banter. But there's always something, whether it's the, whether it's the pants or the, the shirt that like barely hides anything besides your nipples. or It's always something. And, and there was this one, uh, one day that I walk in and she's staring at her phone. And it's clear that she's like, she's smiling and she's browsing through stuff and clicking. And I go, let me see his abs. And she's like, huh? And I'm like, I mean, you've been staring at that thing for like two minutes. He's got to be really good looking. And then she goes, oh, no, he did, the guy doesn't have any pictures. He's on his second account. How'd you know that? And go, I like, come on, I know. And then I go, ah, so how old are his kids? And she goes, what? And I go, well, you said that that's not his main account. The only reason that a guy is going to have a second account on Instagram to try to add you is so that his wife can't see whatever, whatever the hell it is that that. You, you two are, are, are like liking each other's pictures back and forth and commenting and whatnot. So how old are his kids? And then she told me, oh, he's married. He has kids. We used to date, blah, blah, blah. I don't really like him much anymore. I'm not really into him much anymore. Uh, and I'm like, oh, so, so he's got to be really good looking. Show me a picture. He's like, well, no, he's kind of like a six. And I'm like, hmm, what kind of car does he have? And she's like, like well, uh, you, know, you know, it's not a nice car. I don't remember the model, but, you know, he said he would drive me home. And I'm like, huh, so you're. So you're used to being number three then. And she says, number three? No, I'm number one. And I go, well, he's, you know, he's got a wife and kid. And he goes, so? And I said, so you think that he's driving from all the way out here, all the way down here for an hour, then driving you 20 miles home out of his way to drive you, then to go back home and adding you on a second Instagram account for no reason. And she's like, okay, so maybe he still likes me. And I'm like, and do you still like him? And she's like, are you doing this to get a ride home? And she's like, and I remember saying uh, something along the lines of, you know, you could use Uber Pool if you like being number two. There you'll still be number two. At the very least, you won't be a home wrecker. And she's like, ah! <laughs> and, and you know, am I not going to share who I am and how I think because I'm afraid if it's going to upset somebody? I don't particularly care unless she starts spitting in my food, which I really hope she doesn't start doing because I really like eating at this place. As, as, so I, at the end of the day, I left and I, as, as I'm close, um, opening the door to leave the restaurant, I go, good night, number two. And she's like, oh. like, how dare you say that? 
And then I walk in the next day and I said, and then the next day I walk in and, she, and I go, how's it going, number two? Same as always. And she goes, I took the train home. I'm like, high five, good on you. And she gives me a high five and we laugh and we joke and we discuss everything else. This is something that I try to do regularly. Firstly, I want to make sure I exercise my lack of concern for how other people view me on a regular basis while being myself, while not being an asshole version of myself, while not going above and beyond to be like, I don't care what people think so I can treat them like shit. I try to be respectful while being me. And I, and regardless of what type of conversations come up, I don't stop acknowledging my identity. I don't stop acknowledging who I am. Secondly, I, I, I may or may not have kept somebody from becoming a single mom, which is one of the single greatest predictors of childhood misery and potentially criminality later in life. That's a subject for another video altogether. But I was kind of happy. And I do this on a regular basis. I don't mind saying hi to somebody that I'm probably, you know, it's just accepted you don't have to say hi to them. I don't mind bringing up, uh, my, you know, so what do you think of this to the person that's making my burrito at Chipotle? If they're waiting for the, if they're waiting for the pico de gallo to come from the back and they're just standing there, I may ask them something about what's going on in the world and just see what they think and may or, and not care if they're going to go, oh my God, he put me on the spot. This person's asking me what I think. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to think. I'm supposed to contact people before I say what I think. And it's, you know, it's something that I see so often. I mean, I remember going to dinner with some acquaintances that were potential, uh, potential candidates for friendship a few months ago. And they were saying what they did with their day and the things that they had talked about at work and uh, the issues that they were having. And they're like, so what are you thinking of doing tonight? And I said, I'm thinking of doing a video on how baby boomers invented virtue signaling. And you could just tell that like they're like, like I mean, you, you just feel them freeze up. Oh, oh virtue signal. Oh, I, I can't have an opinion on that. If I have an opinion, I have, I have to like, I have to call somebody to, to like figure out what it is I'm allowed to say. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just it's all this horseshit that people do to themselves, and it's and it's and you'll you'll realize it. You'll you'll realize it. it'll be this this um, this eye opening moment when you talk to people who are not afraid to tell you who they are, and they may not like you. That's fine. They may if they may not like you, but you'll tell when you meet people who you can identify with, people who have an identity who you don't identify with, and then when you meet people that have no identity. And it's going to take some time. It's, you're going to have to put in some time and effort to deal with this shit. But I don't want you to blindly accept the term social anxiety when it's been branded onto you by other people who they themselves have problems that are far worse than yours. Please try to acknowledge the fact that maybe, just maybe, the reason that you don't want to talk to others is not because you are fucked up and there's something wrong with you, but because they routinely respond in a fucked up way because of their fucked up upbringing. And if you can realize this, you can free yourself from this, this misery of caring how other people are going to respond to who you are. Be you. Have your identity. Connect. Always try to connect with the world around you and with the people in it. And if they are unable to connect back with you, if they lack the basic capability to connect back with you, and if they have no interest in pursuing the self-knowledge and, um, and everything required to better themselves so that they can actually have an identity and connect with the world around them, and they don't like you, fuck them.